so uh, the first question is about uh, the role of interactions between big data and the model driven approaches in brain disorders. So actually, uh, this morning, uh, that uh, one speaker also mentioned this uh, question: uh, data-driven approaches and uh, hypothesis-driven approaches. So I think so the uh, in the age of big data area, so this uh, this question is very important because uh, it might be uh, conceptually uh, related to some future studies. So, yeah, so, so maybe just. Um, so we're interested in, in big data, but the main challenge for us is not just to get. Um, yes. Uh, so the main challenge for us is not just to get data sets, but to have complete data sets that not only include brain connectivity, but also metadata, uh, age, IQ, some, some cognitive measures. Um, and th that include different modalities. So ideally, we would like to have data sets that include functional connectivity and DTI structural connectivity in order to analyze the, the data. So the, the challenge is really to have this integration between different modalities that are measured. Yeah. I think one of the things that was very clear from listening particularly to epilepsy, and I think it's less, it's also relevant in psychiatric diseases, but, but less so is the um, need to look at the individual subject and it sort of is, it's counter to, you have to set up models that'll be generalizable and this notion of reproducibility, but in fact, the, the devil is in the details with these individual patients. And so I really like the idea of having the simulations so that you could make some predictions and then could see which patients it worked for and which patients it didn't, which could be useful in thinking about why didn't it go the way you thought when the model seemed to be pretty well behaved, but then you have exceptions. So I, th I think it, it does go counter to even all the big discussions about there's a theory of everything and that somehow we have all the data together and, um, and any one you know, experiment has to be replicated by someone else when in, when in fact um, the individual variability may be the source of, of the variance in a, in a fundamental way. Yeah, I think I absolutely agree with what's been said before. Um, on the other hand, though, um, I think there is definitely also value in the in these big data um, approaches. I mean, um, I mean, I'm absolutely a fan of trying to understand and observe very closely at an individual level as well as, as a, at a group level what actually the changes are that we see, and not try and do the machine learning approach and be completely blind to you know what's there, but just see okay, okay, there is a difference, and then we dig into what might be the difference. So I think that's the two sides that you've been discussing: the one on the one hand, the hypothesis-driven; on the other hand, this data-driven approach. So I mean, I think um, we've been doing this hypothesis-driven approach uh, in the past for quite a lot, and I think this data-driven approach is starting to come in, and I think there's value in it, but I think. Ultimately, the really key thing to make real, a real contribution is actually to link the two. And I think you ultimately need to understand um, what is actually driving the effect in your big data analysis, um, as well as you need to test um, your hypotheses with like actual data and big data probably as well to actually see you know what uh, you might have captured 70% of the subjects um, and you're describing that well with your model, but what about 30% of the rest? And you know they might be very a very heterogeneous group that you might be able to capture with a big data analysis better than you know if you just have one individual individual of each um, you know subset. So you know I think there's value to both, but I, I think yeah it's probably just the, the keeping both in mind and value in both is probably the key. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, I think we're very lucky in epilepsy in that we've got access to so much data, which is quite rare in other neurological disorders. But I think the key is to not get bogged down in that data, actually. So much of it is similar to other types of data, and we can easily get lost in that. And so I, I would go along with what you generally say, is again, this mechanistic understanding of the what's driving what we see in the data is, is going to be really important going forward to make sure we don't get lost in it all. Um. I, I think it's important that we uh, uh, draw a distinction between two things which have just been discussed here. Big data versus hypothesis-driven and individual versus cohort. Uh, 
They're two different issues. Big data is how we can explore the individual marginal characteristics of, of any subject in a large cohort. Big data doesn't imply that we are only looking at the average brain or a cohort study. Big data actually is allowing us to look at the individual. That's probably the most important thing that it can do. And then it allows us to, to generate hypotheses which can then be tested in, in a classical hypothesis-driven manner. So first of all, they're not mutually exclusive. They're very complementary. And we have to be very careful not to uh, lump big data into the it's just a cohort study bin. It's not. Since all these epilepsy people that work together are in the same place, I was just wondering, given some of the discussions over the time about plasticity that occurs and with epilepsy, what is it about you think you have a lesion and how the local circuit and the brain kind of big brain changes over time and how do these tools you're developing, can you, can you actually test that? I mean, it just seemed there might be some really interesting ways to, to do that and I was wondering what some of the clues were. Yeah, I was wondering that in your talk actually as well already when you were showing the um, the couple of the weeks the the effect over well immediately over a couple of weeks and then the eight weeks effect and uh, what the plasticity changes there were. Yeah, it's an interesting question I think in epilepsy. I'm not sure if there are uh, many epilepsy clinicians in the audience who might be a better place to answer this question. Um, but uh, from a from a modeling perspective, there's been a lot of um, attempts to, uh, of course, incorporate. Um, Plasticity changes and um, how learning actually impacts uh, epilepsy, and there, there's very there are very tight links, and um, epilepsy over years actually has a dynamics as well, um, implicating that there are probably plasticity changes um, underlying these changes over the years. Um, models can and have uh, to some degree tried that, and I think we definitely need to do more in that field. Basically, is the answer. <laughs> Yes. Um, so, so related to that, um, in 2011, we were looking at motor lesions. So it's not related to epilepsy, but if you lesion parts of the motor cortex in the computer model, you see increased activity at the perilesion area. And that, that's something you, you also see um, in, in, in the real experiments and in, in the real cases. Um, but one question is, how do you get the very slow changes? So those are changes you, you see at, at a very fast stage. But then you have clinical cases where people have a car accident and then 10 years later they have epilepsy. So you have the very slow developmental changes. And at the moment there are no real models out there that go over such a long distance. So there was STDP looking at very fast changes at the synapse level. But if you think about what are models and what are mechanisms uh, over five years or 10 years, there are very few models out there. And it's one of the reasons why we are interested in development as well, to, to get more information about those uh, long-term changes in the system. Well, it's kind of funny because, I mean, depression and epilepsy, you can argue that they're both limbic connectivity disorders. And, you know, certainly the uncinate fasciculus and your lesions in the hippocampus is sort of wondering how um, kind of volumetric or glial abnormalities affect these connectomes and, and your models and whether or not, you know, you talked a lot about the white matter, you know, the connectome system, but, um, that how, how does the volume fit into that, or you know, uh, actual structural lesion? So there's, there's some nice work out of out of uh, UCL, uh, Gavin Winston and John Duncan, who've looked at the white matter changes following surgery, and to see how that longitudinally uh, changes. So they do a pre-op DTI and then a post-op DTI, and then compare the the myelination essentially over time, and you get alterations far away from the surgical site which may or may not relate to seizures coming back on on, on the time scale of years so I, I presented this in quite a simple manner but some patients will have seizure freedom for three five ten years and then the seizures will come back and perhaps that's related to this having not this far away plasticity um, that, that I think it's a good idea for a, a future study but the, the data is not really um, available easily for that. You know, it, it's just so funny because, you know, we've got that we're stimulating and there seemed to be this this odd, you know, I mean, we can't put them back in the scanner to see if the white matter 
changed because we've got the problems with the device and even if we can get them in, you've got corruption of the signal kind of around where you're stimulating. But, but I wonder in the patients that get the, um, the NeuroPACE device or getting thalamic stim, if that recurrence rate is the same and if stimulation versus lesion ends up affecting the connectome differently, it'd be fun to kind of see if you. It'll be interesting to see. <laughs> Nobody's looked at that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Actually, I, uh, I totally agree with uh, the comments from uh, our speakers. So, actually, big data and uh, relevant uh, approaches such as connectomics and the network modeling provide uh, great opportunities uh, to make some findings which cannot be obtained by traditional hypothesis-driven approaches. So, it's very important to combine the uh, different uh, uh, study uh, strategies uh, to. Uh, do some uh, basic research for brain disorders. So let's move on. The next question uh, is about uh, data collection and the data sharing, so which is very important for uh, uh, this area. So in the age of big, big data for neurology and uh, psychiatry, are the kinds of uh, data we collect uh, currently biased? So I know there's many uh, uh, open data sets have uh, uh, many kinds of information such as clinics, uh, behavior measurement, uh, neuroimaging, and genetics, but uh, a very few open access data have uh, electrophysiological data such as EEG and MEG or uh, ECOG data. So about this data sharing, so we know it's very important for brain disorder studies, uh, especially for reproducibility uh, uh, using uh, the large scale data, especially uh, uh, from different size and different researchers. So we can see uh, how much reproducible uh, across the, uh, about the findings across different studies. So actually many scientists are making great efforts to make disease data available, but most of data uh, sharing are mainly for some healthy subjects. So very few open access data are relative uh, brain disorders. So what are big challenges uh, uh, about this sharing in brain disorders? So any comments on the questions? Um, I think it was m me partly uh, who contributed to that question. Um, essentially, it's an observation, and maybe it's my, my limited view, but um, it's essentially an observation that in epilepsy, we actually have maybe one database of electrophysiological data, but there you just don't have any neuroimaging data that you would like, like all the tractography matching with the actual um, uh, MRI matching with the actual CT, matching with the uh, actual, you know, ECOG sites. So there's no, that is, does not exist to my knowledge. Um, some centers might have it, but there's just no open database of that um, in the, on the scale that we see, for instance, for the human connectome uh, project, etc. And on the other hand, you see uh, in Alzheimer's disease quite the opposite. You have all the genetic data, all the um, uh, MR-based uh, data, but you have no electrophysiological data. And I, I, I can understand that it's kind of motivated from where the clinical field has come from. But is there, basically the question was, is there actually value in doing actually a multimodal data um, or setting up a, a framework basically for what sort of modalities we should be collecting in diseases in general, regardless of where the disease uh, is coming from. Uh, you know, whether it's a disease coming based in electrophysiology or based in MR um, diagnosis. It's, I mean, it's such a, a critical issue in sort of seeing how the, these, these large data platforms are trying to be set up to handle all this data. I mean, I'll just say, doing clinical work, that one thing is you have to think about it in advance because the, the clinical data, if it relates in any way to the clinic, at least in the United States, has a protection that becomes onerous. And so all of the kind of shareholders or collaborators have to be thinking in advance how to create a platform that allows that to happen. I just actually, before I left, with, and it came from the epilepsy people, the um, engineer in my lab that does the tractography <coughs> was going to help the people in the epilepsy. And they've been collecting research grade data that has its own protection, but a new clinician comes in and wants to set up to get his, to get research grade clinical scans, you know, we have to pay, patients have to pay. So even the healthcare system influences how data is collected. So you either have patients 
should be coming in the door to be taken care of and have common data elements that could be used for everyone. There should be a way that it can be open to the clinic to have clinical reads and billing for radiology, but that then goes through some chute that gets de-identified and put into a centralized area that everyone shares. It's good for the patient because then they don't have to do multiple things. Uh, the hospital doesn't freak out because you know something isn't de-identified, but everybody's got to figure out what they want to be willing to share, and that's that's without and that's with having a totally open approach to people will work together and do more than anyone will do alone. But now someone had to pay for get that research data and wants to the, reserve the right to do what they thought of. You don't have the resources to create the infrastructure you want, and I mean, it's just, you know, I can drone on and on about it. It's built to fail, and then you get to the end of an experiment and realize, boy, I wish I'd had X, and then you have to start over with the data. So I think that having these examples of, it's now pretty clear what are, are the common things that if we had them for certain diseases, people could work to try to get them. and agree to agree, but I, I think logistically it's hard. In the states now, if you go to write certain kinds of grants in patients, if you don't collect your data like the, um, the, the Connectome project, you won't get funded. So there's a certain prescriptive thing that may or may not work for hypothesis-driven things, but that will give you a built-in set of controls. So. I think people are trying to figure it out. It's just very clumsy right now. And, and, a lot, and it, it mostly comes down to money. You know, someone's got to put it into a place, maintain it, and, and, and all the things that everyone would want, which are these clinical elements, are the things you have to protect. And, and the rules in the states is as soon as you go to anything that is in the clinical record, it all changes. So it's a it, it's a. Yeah. It's, a, it's similar here in the UK. So we have the seven-year project for an implantable device for epilepsy patients. And basically one person was spending a, a full year just for the ethics um, for the uh, MEG scan and MRI scan. So not implanting a device, it's just non-invasive scanning of patients and, and one year to go through all the ethics and all the paperwork. Um, so it's really prohibiting not just sharing but just data gathering. It's, it's, it's difficult. But it also, in, in general, in addition to those large databases, it's very important that individual labs, even if they don't share their data, they just keep uh, a good track record. So I was looking into one model published in 1901 and contacting uh, the PI about that model, and he said, well, the PhD student left. I have no clue how it works. So it's, so it's really important to, to keep track of that. Um, or there was the C. elegans data set that was published in a book in 91 and it was basically 50 pages of tables and a five quarter inch floppy disk. Um, so it took me two months to get the book and then the floppy disk didn't work. So thankfully I was somehow getting the data. So, so it's really important for individual labs as well just to keep the data and to keep the models accessible over a long time, even if there are no existing databases yet. I wonder if I could uh, uh, change gears a little bit and, and, and come back to some of the beautiful uh, connectivity work that we uh, saw today um, and its relation to disease. I've, I've done a fair amount of connectivity work, a lot of it with, with uh, Young Her over the years, and at times it become disillusioned because every disorder has, you know, reduced global efficiency, reduced mm -hmm. local efficiency, re uh, re reduced uh, uh, small world. So, so it, you start to feel like it's not very discriminant, it's not very useful. Do you have a sense of whether there are a, a, a better metrics uh, from the graph theoretical world, world at this point which can be more disease relevant than just, you know, the, the usual ones that we all use? Um, I mean, of course, there's, uh, there's one reason why we want to look into dynamics in the network rather than just the structure of the network um, to see how dynamics are changing in different parts of the brain, how brain rhythms are changing. But it, just in terms of structure, you can look at network flow. So, so basically some measures that are more about uh, information flow in, in the system rather than just the basic structure in the system. Because if you have a hub node, a high degree node, you might say, well, this node might be important. 
but you could also have a node with a very low degree, which is just between two modules, which is very, very important because it's connecting the two modules, but it will not show up as a hub. So if, if you look at flow of information in the system rather than just the basic architecture, I think it will give you a bit more information but, and otherwise moving on towards uh, simulations and dynamics. Yeah, actually, uh, uh, so far there's many studies doing uh, network disruption, just like uh, uh, Alan said. So actually, uh, this is not surprising because we know uh, most of neurological and psychiatric disorders are related to disruption of cognitive functions, because especially the, a, var a variety of cognitive functions, because uh, we know that most of uh, cognitive functions are related to a, a brain network uh, organization. So it's why we found very uh, common findings uh, in neurological and psychiatry disorders using graph theoretical approaches. But the thing is, uh, uh, even there's some common findings, but there's still some difference uh, among different disorders. Uh, for example, they have some different, uh, uh, some disruption of different half set and different set of connections. Possibly they have, uh, this kind of information are very important to uh, understanding and treat, treating the different disorders. Yeah. I mean, I've always kind of found that the graph theory stuff is very enticing, but I don't know what to do with it. Um, on the other hand, if I could set up in normals, you know, setting up a uh, network and know that just to I mean just using our examples um, as a case study, what is if you, if you altered the efficiency of just in the uncinate fasciculus um, with or without um, abnormalities in the hippocampus, what would it do to global efficiency? Because you have atrophy in depression in hippocampus and you have gliosis in hippocampus in selective temporal lobe patients. And so could you actually use clues from pathology or other findings to actually know does this efficiency measure actually mean something you can link to something else? I mean, I mean, I think once you're in the domain you guys are in where you really want to look at network physiology, but, but back to like what can we do kind of for everybody with what does efficiency mean? Um, I think that the simulations at the functional connectivity level cross-platform without physiology could be informative and kind of direct traffic. Yeah, I, I think basically if, if you have, uh, rather than global whole brain metrics of global efficiency, if you have regional efficiencies, that allows you to dis discriminate different subtypes of disease, and epilepsy would be a, a very obvious one, which would benefit from typical subclasses of epilepsy. So can I just make a point? Alan made the, the question you asked was whether there was anything that was relevant to disease. And I think there's a distinction to be made between relevant to disease and specific to disease. So you may be getting information from very generalized connectivity data that uh, informs you about the progress of a disease, providing you know what the disease is. And if that's the case, then maybe the temporal narrative is very important. And catching where the person is in the course of the disease, not necessarily by the clock, but by a biological clock might be quite important. So one of the things that I think in, in progressive diseases people don't necessarily take into account is how long the disease has been there. It's a very crude um, marker of where in the, the story of the disease they are. And clearly early connectivity changes are much more likely to be primary, whereas the secondary ones may be some of the cognitive reactions, uh, the failure of the brain to cope, if you like, with, with uh, the consequence of disease. Yeah, just just talking about um, disease progression. So of course the problem is that people only show up in the hospital at a very late stage. Uh, so if you think about Parkinson's disease, you know many cells are already dead when when they show up in hospital. Yes, 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 yes. Mm, yes. So there, there 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 are two options how how to how to work on that. One option that uh, we're currently looking into is basically simulating development, so changing connectivity and testing under what circumstances do we get into certain brain diseases because then we have some idea what happened before, what are potential mechanisms. The other option is to look at the UK Biobank. So as you might know, it's a measurement, uh, MRI measurement with DTI and, and functional connectivity of 100,000 healthy subjects, um, 40 to 60, I think. 
And the idea is that some of them will later on in 10 or 20 years start to develop dementia and other diseases. So you can go back to the earlier data set to get an understanding how the disease is progressing over time. But of course, we're just starting um, to get the data. So at the moment, there are 15,000 MRI data sets. Uh, there are six centers in, uh, in, in the UK measuring data. So, um, so it will take some time before all the data is available. And of course, then it will take 10 to 20 years before you see uh, diseases. So it's, it, it's a long-term uh, long approach. You know, you make a really important point. I mean, even in how we've tried to approach collecting our depression data. So I've actually been at Emory longer than I've been anywhere, and I've managed to actually have the same sequences and have everything stored. And, and the different cohorts, the fMRI cohort I showed was actually a never-treated cohort, whereas the PET cohort was a recurrent depressed cohort. And the DBS cohort is obviously very refractory. And so now we're kind of going back, instead of asking the original question, is to try to get an idea of, is it an accumulated hit over time with multiple treatments? Or is it just an accumulation over time? You know, Yvette Chalene had shown that hippocampal atrophy was related to how long your depression was untreated. So I think you know you can start to set up these questions if you've actually put your data in a place imagining that you might have, someone else will have a better idea than you did when you started. And actually what we're seeing in our data is everyone has a functional connectivity of the ventral medial frontal cingulate connection. But as you get more recurrent and need other treatments, you start to pick off other connections and there's uh, accompanying white matter abnormalities. So I think that you can kind of set up the model based on a clinical impression and actually look at the data to see if it follows because you've got all the data stored and, and we're trying to figure out how to do that so it'll be accessible to people's questions. Okay. I'm very intrigued um, from from uh, based on something that you said about simulating development, and and um, you mentioned it also at your at your talk, and it's it's very intriguing as a thought that perhaps we can reach at some point the level of knowledge that we can simulate development and see the connections with disease, and and I, I remember some of the papers that you wrote with with Klaus um, uh, ten years ago or something on on development based on. Uh, you had a very simple model of development based on distance, and so I'm wondering, like, right? I'm wondering to what extent you think we are even close to that goal of actually simulating development, considering pruning and considering all the different effects that happen in adolescence. And uh, I mean, are we even close to thinking about that, or is it completely science fiction, basically? Um. So it depends what level uh, you're looking at. Uh, so in terms of pruning, most of the data comes from animal studies. So in, so in terms of, of humans, you can't do lots of post-mortems during, uh, during different stages, not in a systematic way. So of course, you have some embryonic data where you can look at what happens. Um, but there's not enough data to really go down to that level, I would say. And especially if it comes to changes that are based on uh, on training, for example, on, on, on learning, um, I don't think we can really get that local change in connectivity in, in humans at the moment. What we can, however, do is to have different assumptions how brain connectivity is changing at the global level. So global level can be fiber tracked. Um, it can also be features like gyrification and, and cortical thickness. So we get some idea how those features are changing over a couple of years. And this is something we can put into a computer model. But other things are difficult to measure in humans and therefore cannot be part of a model. Okay, uh, last question. So uh, do you think how far from the basic research of big data such as connectomics and the network modeling to uh, clinics? And uh, this is very important. Um, so, so in terms of getting some understanding what changes in patients, I think we are quite far. In terms of understanding how to treat them based on those changes, we are not that far yet. So, so in terms of really understanding, so let's say 
for one individual patient, you see that 10 brain areas show differences in, in connectivity. We still don't know how we then should treat the patient. So what parts of the brain should we target? What is the best approach for that particular patient? I think an even further challenge is convincing clinicians to change their procedures. So in terms of, let's say in our case, epilepsy surgery, um, clinicians have certain procedures that work relatively well and they use those procedures for the last 50 or 100 years. So convincing clinicians to change their approach is, uh, is difficult and it, it depends a bit on the disease, I guess, but it's something that takes potentially a longer time. Change is slow. Um, you know, it's, I, what I've found is that in psychiatry, it kind of pushes the belief system to actually offer, offer this approach. It removes kind of the autonomy of the clinical decision making when there is no ground truth. So you have to actually take the data and demonstrate it and demonstrate it again until they can't look away. And I think, or alternatively, um, demonstrate that it's a proof of principle and then find a surrogate that actually can be implemented. There is a real schism between how psychiatry wants to solve a problem and see this kind of a community and how neurology does. And it, it fundamentally comes down to the way in which business is done. And so I think we just need to plug along so that you can't see it other than the way it is. And, uh, but but it's, it's a battle, even down to when you present a decision tree to be tested, it, 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 it bothers people, and, and that's just religion. So, you know, you just have to kind of have adequate data and, and deal with it. But I, I think that's, that's how any shift in, in how medicine is done. In psychiatry, I mean, people were very, very slow to adopt medication. You know, the psychotherapists, when they started using medication, actually hid I mean, you, I mean, you got kicked out of the club, and then, then everyone realized that both was better. So I, I think this is just a progression. It's, it's not just in, in medicine. So this quote from Max Planck saying that people don't get convinced by a new theory. So uh, the reason why new theories are dominating the field is not that everyone gets convinced, but because the proponents of the old theory die out. So, <laughs> so, so, so it, can be, it can be a very long process. Yeah, actually, the, the validation is very important, uh, especially, you know, uh, for imaging data, for uh, electrophysiological data, as well as re relevant approaches that many influence factors, including uh, uh, diagnosis, uh, uh, analysis approaches, uh, different uh, uh, parameters. So we don't, actually, we don't know uh, uh, the ground truth right now. So it's uh, very important to have uh, 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 more subjects and uh, long-term data, so it's very important to, to do uh, validation analysis. So I think it's very important for uh, right now. Yeah. And I think finally, um, especially from the computational side, I think um, there is also a certain responsibility from the computational people to actually communicate their findings in a way that clinicians can digest it and take it on board. I mean, it, it, it's great if you present there's a higher efficiency here and here, and that's it. I mean, you can't just stop there. You need to go a step further, extend extend an arm in a way to say, you know, and this could be used in such and such a way. You know, almost propose the study that would be useful to then bring this into clinical practice rather than just stop there and say, okay, there are, these are the network, network changes to with it what you want. And so it's, 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 it's a communication, I think, and, and an effort on both sides, I think, that needs to be done. And it, it's happening. It's not, um, it's just slow. <laughs> When, when if, if it's not about the upside, if you get a 70%, it's going well, and you don't, and, and there's no harm, then the added value isn't, the, the, the benefit isn't clear. But I think, you know, in epilepsy, where you've got a non-response rate, understanding what surgical procedure is best for a given brain state has real implications. And, and, and I, I've noticed that, you know, our epilepsy surgeons, they like trying out new things, but they don't want to do things that are dangerous. So if you have got a biometric that tells them, 
in the right direction, I mean, they're definitely going to listen. But until you give them something that has reliability and is well communicated, they don't have any reason to change. And I think that's why our, our, our measures have to show both the added value and, and actually avoiding something that, that is bad. And then, I mean, clinicians are trying to do, do good. They're not that stubborn, but it's got to be um, better. So I think it's, it's really true. You can see it in our field that ideas that are easier to understand are more widely adopted. If you think about graph theory, everyone is talking about hubs and small world and modules. Very few talk about spectral analysis of matrices, which is both as networks, but one is much easier to understand than the other. Um, so I think it really makes a difference to have simple concepts and to, to explain them. So any questions or comments from our audience? Okay, so it's time to uh, close our session. Again, uh, I would like to thank all of the speakers for the critical and uh, important suggestions and the comments. Thank you very much. Thank you.